So we're going to start off by painting this little still life group of four quinces. And I'm hoping to be able to give you a few ideas about how to approach a subject that's close to you like a still life. The great advantage with painting still lives is that they stay still and that you don't have to deal with weather, you don't have to deal with your sitter wanting to take a break. Sometimes people eat the still life, sometimes the still life goes mouldy, but broadly speaking it's cooperative and it's in a controlled space, so it's a good place to learn. It's different from painting a landscape also because you're really close to the subject, so it's three-dimensional, much more so than a landscape which is, broadly speaking, a series of big flat shapes. I'm going to start by painting the spaces between the fruits. Still life is about the relationship between objects, and the temptation always is to head for the subject, to head for the, the thing, the quince, the box of cigarettes. In this instance, I'm going to start and stay quite a long time with the idea that it's the spaces between the objects that I'm focusing on. They're called the negative shapes in the art world or in the world of drawing. So I'm going to paint the negative shapes and I'm going to largely ignore the fruit at the beginning. So let's get started. The word for drawing in a lot of European countries, France and Italy, I know for sure, is disegno or dessin, which is, we have the word drawing, they have the word design. And the key thing at the beginning of any picture is to think about the design and the relationship that the objects that you're painting or drawing have with the rectangular support that you're painting on. I'm just at this stage spacing out the things to get everything on. You start painting with a big brush and you end with a small brush. You start with a six inch brush and you end with a single hair. And you, and you start, you try to put yourself further away from your subject at the beginning so that you don't get drawn into the detail too early. The temptation always is to, is to get sucked into the detail. So if you're painting a person, you paint the eyelashes before you paint the, the head. And the same thing is true with a, with a still life arrangement. You have to try not to generalise, because the whole thing is about concentrating on, on details. But in the first instances, it's about the big shapes and about the way in which they relate to each other and the way in which they interact with the edges of the support frame. The convention obviously in most painting is to paint on a, on a rectangle or a square support. So I've broadly speaking, I've got the, I've got the shapes in, into the, in, onto the support in, the, in, in, a, in, a, in an arrangement with each other. Dr drawing is just about arranging a series of shapes in the right way, that's what it's all about. N now I'm going to do, now I'm going to look at the, the spaces between the shapes. I've been doing that all along, but I'm going to completely concentrate on that now. I'm keeping the paint very fluid. I'm working on a ground that's slightly coloured warm, and I've let it dry. I did it last night, and it's dried overnight, so that there's a basic... I'm not painting on white. Painting on white is, is wonderful, but it's difficult, because whatever you put onto white looks terribly dark and in, a, in a, an arrangement like this it makes things quicker and easier if you work onto a, onto a prepared ground that's a colour, in this case a warm colour. So I just rubbed some raw sienna into the, into the support. I'll go into this in more detail in future but the basic ingredients that you need to get started are enormously simple. Lots of people get terribly wrapped up in the complexity of the materials, but a piece of paper and a few watercolours, or in this case a painted piece of board, just painted with some emulsion and allowed to dry, two or three brushes that can give you a variety of marks that correspond with the marks that you're seeing in your subject, two or three colours are, are, are enough to get you an incredibly long way and it helps when you're starting to paint to restrict the number of colours that you use. Rather than having the full orchestra, it's easier to start with a single instrument or three or four instruments and then work up from that. It's always a sign of a bad painting to see people using every tone and every colour available. It makes life much more difficult. And with oil paint you just thin the colour with turpentine and clean your brush with white spirit. So, as you can see, I've only really painted the background. 
So the quinces haven't really been looked at or thought about a great deal, it's only the background. And as you can see, I'm quite a long way towards describing what's happening in front of me. In art schools, they always used to get people to, when they started life drawing, to paint nothing but the model. So the model would come in and sit down and their students were forced to draw everything except the model and invariably ended up learning A, the importance of negative space and B, how much you could, how much of the model you were describing simply by looking at the interlocking shapes that surround the figure. It also forces you to engage with the environment rather than simply to concentrate on a subject because as I've already said, the, 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 the key with with painting in the last few hundred years, and certainly with the still life, is that you're looking at the relationships between things, and that's about these spaces. Now I'm now going to start to work with the, the fruit themselves. Yellow is quite a complicated uh, colour to deal with because you don't get it in darks, it's, it's always quite light. With reds you can have pinks and you can have very dark reds. With, with yellows you need to start with a really good, intense, intense colour. If you put white into the colour, which I'll just do on the palette, I don't know if you can see that, but on the palette, the colour loses its intensity with white. People try to describe light using white and invariably it kills the colour. So I try to keep the colours at this stage fairly clean and fairly pure and look at the illuminated areas, which are the areas where the colour is most intense and just get some nice wet buttery paint onto those areas. To describe the areas where the light is falling. At this stage the boundary between the fruits themselves and the background isn't really very important. I shall come back in with some line later on to give definition to those areas. The areas in shade are, I think, quite green in this instance. I don't have a green on the palette, but I'm going to use some ultramarine blue and some raw sienna, just to describe the areas that are slightly shaded. The temptation always is to see the object as separate and distinct from its background, but what we have to do all the time is to try and break those boundaries and see them. as the same thing, as though the, the, the surface that the quinces are sitting on was actually made of the same material and in spirit the same thing. The subject that you choose for a still life really obviously doesn't matter, but it should be something that you're drawn to, um, or an arrangement that you're drawn to, and it's, it's, it's uh, as I said at the beginning, it's either something that you arrange from whatever you find in your kitchen, or whatever you find in your wardrobe, or whatever you find in, your, in, the, in the attic, or whatever, but um, the alternative is when you just discover an arrangement of objects that appeals to you. It might be the washing up before it's done next to the kitchen sink or what you find on your bedside table when you wake up in the morning. And it's really good practice simply to spend a few minutes each day with a pen and a piece of paper doing a five minute drawing where you just concentrate on trying to describe an arrangement and a series of relationships between objects. And it may be that if you get good enough you can start to work and make little paintings f from those drawings. A good drawing should contain enough information for you to make a painting from, and your drawing will become much better if you, if you have that as a target. Allowing the brush simply to arrive, make its mark, and then go away again means also that you end up with a clearer, cleaner series of marks. There's a temptation for people to sort of rub the painting with the brush and sort of think that by the, the more that the brush rubs the painting, the better the painting is going to be, and it's almost invariably the opposite, that you just end up with a sort of rivery sludge, which is, is uh, obviously not what we're aiming for. The colour that I'm using is, it has a little bit of white in it, it's actually Indian yellow, a colour that originally used to be made from the urine of cattle fed on mango leaves. I don't think it's still made from that, but... That used to be the, re the recipe used to involve some work that may not have been hugely popular. People talk about drawing and painting as being distinct and separate activities sometimes, and they're not. All the time in painting you should be drawing and correcting 
the mistakes that you make when you start drawing, when you start a drawing, almost every mark that you make will be or is likely to be wrong. And good drawing is, is mainly about simply correcting the mistakes that you make and aiming by the end of the drawing to have set up a series of relationships that have some, some relationship with some sort of truth. I have a little lid full of turpentine on the corner of the palette that's sort of stuck down with a bit of old paint and it's there so that I can dilute the paint. When you're beginning a painting, the paint should start thin and end up fat. So you start with a very liquid kind of paint which bonds with the surface, the support that you're painting on. And gradually as the painting proceeds, the amount of turps should decrease and the amount of oil and paint should increase so that you end up not diluting it very much. That way the painting has some chance of survival. You can see I'm moving around all the time, not getting... The temptation is always to just kind of do one quince and then move to the next and then move to the next, but I think it's really important to allow your eye to move around the subject all the time and, and the brush to move around as well so that you there's a sort of unity of colour and unity of treatment that covers the whole of the support, the whole of the painting. The other great way of learning about pictures is obviously to find pictures that you admire and like. You know, the, great, the really great teachers are the, are the masters of painting who, whose work is amazingly available. And if you look at those pictures, not just for the images, but also try and work out what colours were used try and work out how the pictures were painted. You can always spot the artist in an art gallery because they're looking at the work from three inches away rather than 25 feet away. It's because they want to try and find, find out not just the recipe, but, the, but the, 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 the way that the paint is, is, uh, is articulated on the support. And um, it's the best way to learn. The same is true with drawing, to look at really good drawings doesn't mean that when you go to draw you have to copy what they've done, but there are many lessons to be learned from looking at other people's work. Trying to allow the brush to move around the form all the time, to follow the, the form in section and not just to concentrate on the, on the edges. So here there's a line that tells me that that section of the lower part of the quint is, is cylindrical rather than going around the, around the edge where the, light, where, the, where the quince is set against the dark background of the rug. I'm trying to allow the brush stroke to follow the form around in the same way as a, a bracelet or a rubber band would, would give you a huge amount of information about the, about the form. The palette, which very often should be quite close in tone and colour to the support that you're working on, is, is, is really the rehearsal area. You can set up relationships between colours on the palette to see if they work before committing them to the, to, to the paint surface. People are enormously reluctant to do this, but it's really a, a really important part of, 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 of making sure that when the, when the brush arrives on the, on, the, on the painting, it's got a fighting chance of doing something vaguely all right. You need all the time to think about whether the colours work nicely together, whether they feel lovely. The magic of paint is that this incredible material which people have loved and worshipped for such a long time allows you to set up these extraordinary relationships. It's a very personal thing, but it should always, all the time, it, you, you get a, a thrill, a buzz from seeing what the colours do in relation to each other. And uh, that's the sort of the nourishment that the painter gets as they're working, is that you're just seeing all these extraordinary things. Quite often they're accidental. Um, where you just end up thinking, sits doing something, and then and then realizing that actually you've set up a relationship that feels nice. Most people have a time frame in which they feel comfortable painting, and for almost everybody, except the most experienced painters, a picture looks better at the beginning than it does at the end. It's quite a difficult thing to paint a picture that takes a week to paint. It's a relatively easy thing to paint a picture that takes a morning to paint. The excitement and the energy of the, what's called the lay-in, which is the first part of painting a picture where you just put the structure in, is always quite invigorating and quite exciting. 
The skill is to keep everything fresh and to keep the excitement and the energy levels up and to keep the paint looking fresh and exciting. And we're not trying to paint something in a formulaic way, we're trying to see a, a series of objects as though they're unfamiliar, as though we've never seen them before, and try and bring some excitement and interest to the, to the thing. There are formulaic ways of painting which are of no real interest to me. That, you know, when you walk into a bathroom, you switch the light switch on with your elbow. We need to think in that way about the visual world because otherwise we'd spend our whole time searching for the light switch. But when you go into a studio, you have to start seeing things as though they're unfamiliar. And a lot of learning to draw and learning to paint is about finding ways of seeing things with fresh eyes. That's what makes it such a lovely a lovely thing to do and makes it interesting if you can do it for other people as well because you're giving them a chance to see things in that way too. And that's pure magic. I'm adding a, a, in, the, in the lighter passages where the, where the fruits are, are, are getting the strongest light, I'm just adding a slightly cooler colour. Um, I'm actually not completely sure that it's a good idea but it's going on and it's feeling in some places quite nice. Um, the, the, one of the principles with a lot of painting is to do with massing light to areas and dark areas together. It's something that you have to keep thinking about even if you don't uh, actually do it. And in this area, obviously, there's a very dark background with four basically pretty brightly lit, lit fruit. So it's very obvious to mass the darks and the lights together. There isn't really any other way of doing it. Um, but within the light passages, it's nice to have, uh, without tonal variation, in, without variation in between light and dark, to have different colours performing simultaneously. So a, 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 a very light yellow and a very light green can um, create a sort of intensity and a kind of flicker of colour that's really nice. Um, I say that and very often it works, but I'm, I'm not sure. The problem with the very intense yellows is that, is that it's very difficult to find the colour of the same tone that actually has that intensity. And that's the problem that I'm having with this. But the idea, I think, is a good one. And in some places there, I think it's working quite well. Possibly there, but in some areas not. But the principle is, 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 is good that within passages of light or dark, um, you have colours that are of the same of the same tone but of different colour and that you know spots of colour also work work very well to, to sort of enlighten and to flick your sort of it's a way of painting the light and the so the impressionists did the space between you and the object that you're painting you don't just paint the objects you try and capture the, the sort of atmosphere the sort of air between things and sometimes by adding spots of colour you can do that I've just got to make sure that they don't just feel like cutouts and that they're sort of sitting on the on the rug and that means I've got to let the background into the fruits a little bit a lot of painting is about what comes first, what sits on top of what. Some colours sit, on, sit comfortably on top of other, other colours and some, some don't. But also, the, you know, if, you, if I want the, the quince to be in front of its background, really I need to paint the background first and then the quince on top of it. I say that and there are all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't do that, but, that, but there has to be a sense that the brush strokes, if you want it to come forward, the brush strokes of the quince are on top of, at least in some places, what's sitting behind it. Sometimes you need to live with a picture for a bit to see whether it works. It's a good idea to take things home and see them in different lights and to see whether in a different frame of mind when you're not near the paints and near the brushes whether the pictures, whether the pictures work. Some artists, someone told me recently that Anselm Kiefer puts things away for months and in a great big container or box or something and then revisits them and then of course you can see them with fresh eyes. The danger always with painting is that you get completely tangled up in it and you stop really seeing the picture in any way objectively and it's something that painters I think wrestle with because you want to press on and you want to resolve things but at the same time sometimes you need to get someone else to look at it or see it when you're drunk or see it when you're sad or see it in artificial light or 
somehow. By allowing the brush strokes to be to be visible and by not rubbing, there's a little bit more air in the space behind, which I think gives you a sense that there is some space there and that they aren't just cutouts or holes or that it isn't just a completely flat series of shapes. It gives me a chance to draw the negative spaces again and also to re-examine the edges of the little the little medieval people that the quinces are. The a pic question that people ask a lot is about is, is when do you stop? Or when, you know, because the picture is obviously never finished, so it's just it's not about finishing the picture, it's just about deciding not to do any more. And it's it's a, it's an incredibly difficult thing to answer. I think that the business of taking the picture away and seeing it in another space at an odd time of day is a helpful way of, of, of resolving that sometimes. But uh, anybody who paints knows that you can, you know, how it's incredibly easy to ruin, to ruin the work that you're doing by overworking it. Quite often you feel pangs of nostalgia for the stage in the picture's life when it actually looked half decent. In this case, it's just going to be informed by how long we can film me working on this thing for, because I could come back to it in a week or a month or in a year. But we'll get to a stage where I've said, I hope, some useful things about the process. And then we may revisit it at some later stage. I'm leaving that there, not because it's there, but because it's just a really nice little stepping stone from the su surface that the that the quinces are sitting on, and I kind of need to do that everywhere really, to just try and break down that, that, that awkward boundary so that the quinces start to sit and try and take some marks up from the, from the, the, um, the rug into the, into the little fruits. And the lovely thing about painting is that you can just keep, keep going on and on and on keep revising. It's incredibly difficult, as I said before, to keep the paint fresh and alive, but if you just let it dry, turn it upside down and paint something else on it, you can enjoy the richness of all the marks that you've, that, that, that you've made and sometimes do something that you, that you like a bit more. For, from the point of view of this particular session, there is a beginning of a painting.